Hey guys, this is Bjorn Joshua with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. This week we will be talking about PetroChina, which is Asia's largest oil and gas producer. In this video, we'll briefly go over the company's business, then focus on the company's fundamentals by reviewing the key ratios. We'll look at the company's pricing structure and the government regulations that are enforced in China. And finally, look at the company's discounted free cash flow decent analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company. So let's dive in and review PetroChina. Hey guys, let's briefly go over the company. I'm on ticket terminal looking at PetroChina Company Limited. PetroChina Company Limited, together with its subsidiaries, engages in a range of petroleum related products, services, and activities in mainland China and internationally. The company operates through exploration and production, refining and chemicals, marketing, and natural gas and pipeline segments. The company's exploration and production segment engages in the exploration, development, production, and marketing of crude oil and natural gas. Its refining and chemical segment refines crude oil and petroleum products and produces and markets primary petrochemical products, derivative petrochemical products, and other chemical products. The company's marketing segment is involved in marketing of refined products and trading business. And finally, its natural gas and pipeline segment engages in transmission of natural gas, crude oil, and refined products, and sale of natural gas. Now let's quickly go over the revenue and the profitability across these four operating segments. For the year 2020, the marketing segment brought in majority of the company's revenue. All the operating segments saw a decline in the year 2020 when compared to the revenue brought in in the year 2019. This drop in sales was primarily due to the pandemic. Next, looking at the profitability, we can see that the exploration and production and the natural gas and pipelines are the only two profitable segments for the year 2020. The only operating segment in the year 2020 that was profitable and saw growth in that year was the natural gas and pipeline segment. This is likely because people stayed indoors during the pandemic and used natural gas to heat up their houses and cook their food, which is the reason why we see a growth in the year 2020. Now that we have a brief understanding of the company's four operating segments, let's briefly go over the company's key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at PetroChina Company Limited. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. All the numbers here are millions of Chinese yuan. Back in 2011, the company brought in about 2 trillion yuan. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 2.2 trillion yuan. Over the past 10 years, we did see the revenue decline from 2014 through 2016. However, over the past few years, the company's revenue has stayed fairly consistent. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is what we get when we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about 180 billion yuan. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 165 billion yuan. The company's operating income has a similar trend as the company's revenue. The company's operating income declined from the year 2014 through 2016. However, after that, we do see that the company's operating income recovered and has been trending upwards. After that, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about 133 billion yuan. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 102 billion yuan. PetroChina's net income trend is similar to that of the company's operating income and revenue. We did see that the company's net income dropped off after the year 2014 all the way through 2016. After that, the company's net income recovered. We do see that for the year 2020, the company's revenue, operating income, as well as net income were lower than the previous years. This is because of the pandemic where the company's sales declined, which resulted in the company reported a lower net income number. The company's net income over the past 10 years has been positive, which means that the company never reported a loss in those past 10 years. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, the company paid out about 34.54 yuan per share as dividend. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 17.45 yuan per share as dividend. PetroChina has paid out a dividend every year for the past 10 years. Next, looking at the shares outstanding. Back in 2011, the company had 1,830 million shares outstanding. And for the trailing 12 months, it is the same number, which is at 1,830 million shares outstanding. Over the past 10 years, we can see that the company's shares outstanding number has not grown, which tells us that the company is not diluting the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. After that, looking at the book value per share, the book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2011, the company's book value was about $84.43 per share. And for the trailing 12 months, that number had grown to about $106.93 per share. PetroChina always had a positive book value per share, which shows that the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow. The free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, the company's free cash flow was about 16.6 billion yuan. 
And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 98.8 billion yuan. Ideally, we want to see the company's free cash flow to be positive, staying steady or increasing. Over the past 10 years, there was only one unique year back in 2013 when the company's free cash flow was negative, primarily because the company's capital spending exceeded its operating cash flow. However, over the past few years, the company's free cash flow has always been positive. I will be using the 2020 figure of 61.848 billion yuan for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 6.64%, and for the trailing 12 months, it was about 4.63%. What this means is every $100 that the company made over the past 12 months, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had $4.63 left as pure profit. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that had a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, the company's return on equity was about 13.7%, and for the trailing 12 months, it's about 8.36%. We can see that from 2015 through 2020, the company's return on equity was less than 8%. Next is the return on invested capital. The return on invested capital gives us an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 10.9%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number is about 6.23%. PetroChina's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 4.37%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the management is creating value for its shareholders. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had an interest coverage of five times or higher. Back in 2011, the company's interest coverage was about 17.92 times. And for the trend 12 months, that number was about 10.66 times. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want to see the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was at 0.68, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.91. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. A quick ratio greater than 1.0 tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 0.23, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.44. PetroChina's current and quick ratios for the latest quarter are much better than they were 10 years ago. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage ratio tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. A financial leverage of 1.0 tells us that all of the company's assets are financed via shareholders' equity. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 1.91, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.02. Ideally, we want to see the company's financial leverage to be staying steady or decreasing, and we can see that in the case of PetroChina, the company's financial leverage has stayed steady over the past few years. Finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want to see the company's debt-to-equity ratio to be less than 1.0. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. Back in 2011, the company's debt-to-equity was at 0.18, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.31. Now let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the date actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, the company's day sales outstanding was about 9 days, and for the trailing 12 months, it's about 11.34 days. Over the past 10 years, the company's day sales outstanding number has stayed fairly consistent, and that is certainly something that we want to see. We do not want to see a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, because that tells us that the company is being aggressive with its accounting and recognizing its sales sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. However, in the case of PetroChina, we're not seeing that, and that is certainly a good sign. Next is the day's inventory. This number gives an idea of how many days is PetroChina's products set in its inventory before they're sold. Back in 2011, the company's day's inventory was about 47 days, and for the trailing 12 months, it's about 38 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing. In the case of PetroChina, the company's day's inventory number has slowly been trending downwards, which is a good sign. 
Next is the payables period. This number gives an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, the company took about 31 days to pay its suppliers. And for the chilling 12 months, it took about 26 days to pay its suppliers. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. We do not want to see a company whose payable spirit is growing rapidly because that tells us that the company will be holding on to its cash in order to inflate its cash flow numbers on its cash flow statement. However, in the case of PetroChina, the management is not playing any such accounting tricks. Finally, looking at the inventory turnover, this number gives an idea of how many times does the company's inventory go through its system in a calendar year. Back in 2011, the company's inventory turnover was about 7.74 times and for the trading 12 months, it's about 9.67 times. Ideally, we want the company's inventory turnover to be staying steady or increasing. And we can see that over the past 10 years, the company's inventory turnover has slowly been trending upwards. Now let's compare the company's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. PetroChina has a PE of 5.8, whereas S&P 500 is at 24.1. PetroChina's price to book is at 0.5, whereas S&P 500 is at 4.3. PetroChina's price to sales is at 0.3, whereas S&P 500 is at 3.0. PetroChina's price to cash flow is at 1.7, whereas S&P 500 is at 17.2. And finally, the dividend yield. PetroChina has a dividend yield of 6.7%, whereas S&P 500 is at 1.5%. So on all these valuation metrics, we can see that PetroChina is undervalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, when it comes to China, it's important that we also look at this company's pricing structure so we can get a better idea of what the future oil prices can do to this company's profitability. So on page 48 of this Form 20F, which is the annual report that PetroChina files with the SEC, the company talks about its pricing policy. The company says that in the recent years, the pricing of gasoline, diesel, natural gas and pipeline transmission services have either been subject to government guiding prices or government set prices while the pricing of crude oil and other refined products are not subject to any government regulation. On the next page, the company talks about how this pricing structure works, which I've summarized here in red. If the international crude oil price is less than $40 a barrel, then the price that the government calculates will be based on as if the international crude oil price is still trading at $40 a barrel. If the international crude oil price is between $40 and $80 a barrel, then the price will be calculated after taking into account the company's normal operating profit margin. Next, if the international crude oil price is above $80 a barrel, then the profit margin of that company will be reduced until it's $0. Finally, if the international crude oil prices are above $130 a barrel, then the government would take the hit. In other words, it would reduce its taxes and provide financial and tax policy adjustments. So to sum it up, PetroChina will report a positive profit number whenever the crude oil prices are less than $80 a barrel. Whenever they're greater than $80 a barrel, then the profit margin will drop to $0. And if the international crude oil prices are greater than $130, then the government would step in and provide financial incentives. And realistically, it's highly unlikely that with the shale revolution that the crude oil prices can be above $80 a barrel for a sustained period of time, because at those prices, fracking becomes very profitable. So when people start fracking, that brings in additional supply of crude oil. And with that additional supply, the prices are bound to drop. And the company does give us an idea on page 62 where the company does provide us information about its operating expenses as far as how much does the, it cost the company to get the crude oil out of the ground, which for the year 2020 was about $11.10 per barrel. Let's go back to page 48 and talk about the natural gas pricing that the company has. It states that for the infrastructure that was put into operations after 2015, the pricing is based through competition. And for the infrastructure that was put into operations before the end of 2014, the pricing is determined by existing pricing mechanism and will be liberalized and become market-based in due course as the reform to marketize the natural gas sector progresses. The company mentioned that there is a benchmark price that is set by local governments and though the pricing that is set by the companies can be no more than 20% above those benchmark prices. Apart from this benchmark pricing, the natural gas segment is becoming more free market-like as it says that the NDRC also rolled out seasonal natural gas prices to encourage market-oriented pricing. The natural gas production and marketing enterprises and users are encouraged to proactively trade on natural gas trading platforms. And the prices of natural gas are publicly traded on natural gas exchanges such as Shanghai Oil and Gas Exchange and Chongqing Oil and Gas Exchange are entirely driven by market conditions. Now that we have a brief understanding of PetroChina's market structure, let's review the company's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company. Hey guys, now let's look at the discounted free cash flow DCF analysis for PetroChina. 
Over here, I pasted the company's 2020 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which was actually 61,848,000,000 Chinese yuan. And the current conversion rate of one Chinese yuan is equal to 0.16 US dollars. So the US dollar equivalent of the 2020 free cash flow was $9,896,000,000. I'm assuming that the annual growth rate of free cash flow will be 4%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 4% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me a 10% return. I'm using a long-term growth rate of 3%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 3%. The company has 1,830 million shares outstanding and it has a long-term debt of $40,221 million. Afternoon all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $61.19 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price of about $50.14 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about 18% below the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows which come out to about $73.6 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10 year mark into perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $152.2 billion. From this number, we subtract the long term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $61.2 per share. Now, if you disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that PetroChina is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $18 per share. And finally, if you disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that PetroChina is going to grow into perpetuity, so there's no point for the company to worry about its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $83 per share. So in short, the company has strong fundamentals. It is undervalued not only from a discounted free cash or decent analysis standpoint, but also when we looked at the company's price to earnings and price to book ratio, we saw that the company was undervalued. When we glance over the company's balance sheet, we could see that about two thirds of the company's planned property and equipment is depreciated. So it is not that PetroChina is inflating its assets numbers on its balance sheet in order to come up with a higher book value number. PetroChina's return on equity numbers are subpar. However, with the increased demand for natural gas not only in China but internationally, along with the additional refining capabilities that PetroChina has invested in, it is likely that the company's earnings are going to grow in the future. And with the growth in those earnings, we're likely to see a rebound in the company's return on equity numbers. And lastly, about 80% of the company's shares outstanding are held by the Chinese government. So when it comes to management making decisions, they're going to be such that it puts Chinese people and China ahead of the company's shareholders' interests. However, when it comes to profit sharing and dividend payouts, we would be standing right next with the Chinese government as shareholders collecting those payments. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on PetroChina interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, Please leave it in the comment section below, I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.